Welcome to this unit of our course, where we are going to explore different features of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is directly related to the metabolic syndrome. But first, let us start with a closer look at the functions of the liver and how those functions connect to the metabolic syndrome. The liver is the largest solid organ of our body. The human organ consists of four big parts called lobes. The liver performs hundreds of vital functions and plays a central role for many metabolic processes for our body, including glucose and lipid metabolism. On top of that, it is also the major organ for removing toxins from our blood. A structure that is closely attached to the liver is the gallbladder, which produces bile, and this is extremely important for fat digestion. When we zoom onto the fine structure of the liver, we can see that the major population found here are the hepatocytes. Each lobe consists of many lobules. These are almost hexagonal structures that are built up by hepatocytes and blood vessels and also bile ducts. In addition to hepatocytes, we can also find an active population of immune cells. Of note are the macrophages of the liver, the so-called Kupfer cells. In healthy liver, they maintain normal liver functions. However, during the development of fatty liver disease, they also secrete inflammatory cytokines, which lead to hepatic inflammation. In the first unit, we heard that I need a transport vehicle to travel in the bloodstream. Could you tell us more about how those are built by the liver? Of course, Ali. As we all know, fat doesn't mix with water. And vehicles are needed for the transport in the blood, which are called lipoproteins. They are spherical particles that have a core of neutral lipids and cholesterol esters, surrounded by a single layer of phospholipids. Phospholipids have a fat-loving side that faces the inside of the sphere, and a water-loving head group that faces the water-based bloodstream. There are also proteins of different kinds, the so-called apolipoproteins, embedded in the phospholipid layer. We distinguish several types of lipoproteins, mainly characterized by their density and by the appearance of different apolipoproteins on their surface. The first ones that they are quite big and loosely packed with triglycerides. The smaller they get, the more dense they are, and the core contains more cholesterol esters, which is a particular hydrophobic form of cholesterol. Let's look at the circulation of lipoproteins in the body. After digestion, the first particles are released by the intestines into the lymph. They are called chylomicrons, and they are characterized by high triglyceride content. A protein found on the chylomicrons is apolipoprotein B. Through the lymphatic vessel, they enter the bloodstream and provide fatty acids to tissues like adipose tissue and muscle. Ooh, I know what will happen next. There's an enzyme called lipoprotein lipase sitting outside the cells which hydrolyzes the triglycerides and the released fatty acids are taken up by the tissues. With this action, the chylomicrons shrink and become so-called remnants that are taken up by the liver. Yes, in the liver, the next class of lipoproteins is produced, the very low-density lipoproteins, or BLDL. As their name suggests, they still have a low density and are therefore rich in triglycerides. Also, those are a substrate for the lipoprotein lipase. Thereby, the content of triglycerides decreases and more cholesterol esters remain. Now we get to a class that many of you might already heard of, the low-density lipoproteins, or LDL. Often, it is also referred to us as the bad cholesterol. Elevated LDL is a risk factor for cardiovascular diseases, and also a prognostic factor for the metabolic syndrome, as you remember from the first unit. Can LDL also be removed from the body? Yes, of course, Ali. The liver plays an important role here. There are three receptors at liver cells that bind LDL and leads to its uptake and clearance from the bloodstream. If LDL is not properly removed by the liver cells, 
it accumulates in the blood, where its structure can also change and then it can ultimately cause atherosclerosis. This is a condition that we will specifically discuss in the unit about the heart. Yeah, the counterpart of LDL and the supposedly good guy here is the high-density lipoprotein or HDL. HDL contains apolipoprotein A, which is also the marker for it as in a blood test. HDL actively takes up cholesterol from tissues and brings it back to the liver. This process is called reverse cholesterol transport. This way cholesterol can be excreted from the body in the form of bile acids. Those bile acids are actually found in the bile, as it suggests, and they are important molecules for emulsion of fat during digestion. How about sugar? It cannot be all about fat again! No worries, Asu. We get to that now. The liver has actually a very important role in regulating whole body glucose homeostasis. As we already have mentioned, it has the ability to store glucose in the form of glycogen. Hepatic glycogen content varies during the day and constitutes up to 10% of the weight of the liver in humans. Since the liver weighs about 1.5 kg, that is up to 150 grams. And up to one third of the glucose that we actually ingest during the day ends up here. There you go! I know that this glycogen storage can be accessed quickly when sugar is needed during fasting for other tissues, such as the brain, red blood cells, and muscles. Students, can you tell me what the difference between glycogen and starch is? Thanks, Asu, for giving us a bit of insight into the difference of these molecules. Now, let's continue to discuss what happens with glucose metabolism during the metabolic syndrome in the liver. We already talked a lot about insulin resistance also affecting the liver in the metabolic syndrome. But what is going on there? In individuals with diabetes, the liver produces more glucose as in normal individuals. The insulin-dependent suppression of hepatic glucose production is then impaired. Thus, insulin cannot stop the glucose production from the liver. This is often associated with high lipid content in the liver a condition we will hear about later in this unit. When we are not eating, for example, during the night, our body still needs glucose. The liver can produce that in a process called gluconeogenesis. This contributes to approximately half of the total hepatic glucose production. And it is also primarily responsible for the increase in fasting glucose in the individuals with diabetes. The liver metabolism is not only affected by insulin, but also by other factors. On top of that, the liver itself produces factors that influence the whole body and it receives signals from other organs like the adipose tissue. This is called organ crosstalk and it is essential in energy metabolism. Organ crosstalk also helps us to understand why the metabolic syndrome affects the whole body. I suppose I'm again obsolete in the liver, right? I might not carry any energy, but I want to state my importance in the metabolic syndrome. Not at all, Asa. Don't worry. You play quite a, an important role here in the liver as well. Some publications suggest that high salt consumption, which is often the case in our Western diet, also affects liver cells and actually damages them. On top of that, high salt also increases liver fibrosis and really contributes to the development of the metabolic syndrome. In this video, we had a closer look at liver lipoprotein and glucose metabolism and how they are changed in the metabolic syndrome. Next, we will move on to talk about signals from and to the liver that affect metabolism.